An 8-core CPU was a rare and precious thing just six short years ago, three of which don't really count. AMD had tried to bring them to the mainstream with their bulldozer lineup in the early 2010s, but those CPUs would ultimately fail to live up to their promise. Team Red weren't ready to give up on the 8-core dream, however, and the launch of Ryzen saw AMD return to smash Intel's HEDT ivory tower, marking a turning point in PC history. The first generation of Ryzen was important, but the question is, four generations later, is it any good? Ryzen sparked a revolution in CPUs. Intel weren't exactly caught napping, but their mainstream range did take a couple of iterations to catch up to AMD in terms of core count. Intel had, in fact, been making 8-core processors for high-end desktop and server markets since as far back as 2010, but it's worth reiterating just how expensive this stuff was. In 2012, 8-core Xeons had a trade price of over 1500 US dollars. The i7-6900K was Intel's consumer 8-core offering at the time Ryzen was first released, and its MSRP was over $1000. This was the environment in which the Ryzen 7 1700, 1700X and 1800X were released, all essentially different bins of the same CPU. The one I have here is the cheapest model with a maximum turbo of 3.7 GHz, 200 MHz higher than the 5960X, but with a smaller 16 MB L3 cache and only dual channel DDR4. Considering the $329 asking price, it's not surprising that there were some areas in which the Ryzen couldn't compete with Intel's extreme lineup. This was AMD's first foray into DDR4, and the controller would prove to be quite picky with which RAM could be used and at what clock speeds. Early Zen yields wouldn't handle overclocking well either, and passing 4GHz would prove to be a difficult and ultimately unrewarding task. Testing this 2017 CPU in 2023, I'm using an MSI Tomahawk B450 Max 2 motherboard with four 8GB sticks of DDR4 4000. Alas, they weren't stable at any frequencies above 3000, however I was able to drop the cast latency of this fairly generic RAM down to 15, and I'm sure some better quality B-Die sticks would probably get even better results at CL14 or lower. The CPU itself is running at 3.8 GHz, again that's as high as I could push it without instability, cooled with a basic Vitru single tower cooler, and the GPU is my usual RTX 3070 from Gigabyte. Valorant isn't usually the best case for testing heavily multi-threaded CPUs, but it's also a great illustration of IPC gains over time. Averaged over three matches, the overclocked 1700 scored 235.1 FPS, exactly the same as the roughly contemporary i7-7700, which didn't have the benefit of an overclock, and which also managed slightly better 1% and 0.1% lows. For a little more context, the Zen 2 based Ryzen 7 4700G performs about 20% better at only 13% higher clock speeds. It's not a perfect comparison as the 4700G is a monolithic chip with only 8 megs of L3 cache, but it also has the advantage of DDR4 4000. None of this is all that important however, as they're all utterly blown away by Zen 3. In Battlefield 5, the first gen Ryzen's performance falls off quite a lot from the competition. I believe this game is one that benefits from AVX2 instructions, and while Zen 1 does technically support that instruction set, I hear it's a pretty big weak point for AMD that was only really resolved by Zen 3. Across about an hour and a half of gameplay, in which I performed spectacularly badly, so did the Ryzen 1700. It averaged just 107 FPS, a score comparable to an ancient Sandy Bridge Xeon, 30% adrift of the competing quad-core i7 from the same year, and 50% short of the Ryzen 4700G. Fortnite's performance mode offers some better news for Zen 1 owners. 
but not by a huge amount. The Ryzen 7 1700 can average about 200 FPS, which is less than 10% removed from the i7-7700, but still very playable, and a good reason to pair this setup with a 144Hz display. It's a good amount short of the other, far more expensive 8-core CPUs that were on the market in 2017, but given the price differential at the time, and the lack of upgrade options to those platforms today, it's not at all surprising, or even all that relevant. What is relevant is the difference from Zen 3. If you only just bought your Ryzen 1700, you might want to uh, not look at that top line of the chart. Flight Simulator is another catastrophic result for the Ryzen 1700, with an average FPS of just 40. I've excluded some of the dual and flat quad-core results from this chart, as the game resorts to LOD shenanigans to inflate their performance, but among equals, this chip comes close to the bottom of the table. Those two Xeons beneath it on the chart cost less than $10 each, and there are older 8-thread chips that can manage more than 20% higher frame rates. Thankfully, high FPS isn't critical in this title, but still, if you're building a budget flight sim rig, you should probably invest in something newer. The news isn't much better in the AAA action game arena either. I give Spider-Man Remastered two runs, one with RT and one without. The rasterized test is largely playable, averaging 85, but with some pretty nasty 1% lows making it a substantially worse experience than the i7-7700. The tables turn, however, when RT comes into play. At 59 FPS, the Ryzen's now hanging with the Haswell and Broadwell extremes, and is actually kinda playable. Though, again, its younger relatives are doing a lot better. In recent weeks, I've added a third run to my Cyberpunk tests, mainly because I designed my benchmark runs around older chips, and newer, higher performance CPUs are getting too close to being GPU bound. Well, that wasn't a big issue this time around. At both 1440 Ultra with DLSS quality and 1440 Medium with DLSS balanced, the Ryzen 1700 is definitely holding things back. Both results are nearly identical, and a roughly 60 FPS average is a decent result and eminently playable, on par with what can be achieved with a stock i7-7700. The margins are smaller when RT is enabled, but 44 FPS is still a big step down from the near 60 FPS of the newest chips. Also, small shout out to the i7-5960X, which costs about the same as the Ryzen 1700 on today's market, and competes handily with Zen 3 here. RDR2 is another game which I've had some concerns with about becoming GPU limited, but which is definitely not a problem in today's tests. Despite Afterburner reading a near 100% GPU usage, the CPU is holding things back here. 56 FPS is actually one of the worst results I've seen, lower even than the i7-2600. I've yet to test one, but I think even a Skylake i5 might score higher than this. Dropping DLSS down to performance, effectively rendering at 720p, adds less than 10% to this frame rate, and for some reason the metrics still suggest it's GPU bound. The updated Witcher 3's results are pretty much what you'd expect to see when compared to an i7 from around the same time, but for a DX12 title, this is slightly disappointing. The extra threads would hopefully give the 1700 an advantage over chips like the i7-5775C, and it does benefit from better 1% and 0.1% lows than the quad-core Broadwell, but again, new horizons leave this one for dust. Finally, in the ever more exciting battle for Civ 6 supremacy, the Ryzen 1700's 7.03 second average turn time can only claim a small victory over some of its contemporary competitors. Among the other 8 cores I've tested so far, this one is distinctly mid-table. <laughs> 
as a productivity tool, the Ryzen 7 1700 still has some things in its favour. The synthetic results suggest this should be on par with some of the 8-core Intels that I've generally had praise for, and it does so while using dramatically less power. As far as games are concerned, however, it's a less positive conclusion. Time hasn't been kind to the first generation of Zen, but then again, it hasn't been kind to its competitors either. The advantage an owner of a Ryzen 7 1700 has over an i7-7700 owner is that they can update their motherboard's firmware and install a far more competitive Zen 3 chip with minimal fuss, and in 2023, that seems like the wisest move to make. What makes less sense is the idea of buying one for a budget gaming build. A cheap 6-core in the Ryzen 5000 series, or Intel 10th or 11th generation, makes far more financial sense than spending only slightly less on one of these. Wait, hang on a sec. You can pick one of these up on AliExpress for £42 delivered. That puts a different spin on things. Now you're potentially looking at a CPU, motherboard and RAM for less than 120 quid. That's still more expensive than an X99 bundle, but you'd be getting something with an upgrade path and a decent usable UEFI. Hmm. At that price, it's a bit more of an interesting prospect. Let me know what you think below. Thanks for watching. Kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.